Ma'am, we are on live and uh, we are starting the session, ma'am. Yes. So, very good evening, doctors. I'm Dr. Stalin on behalf of uh, Shield Healthcare, welcoming you all for the today's webinar. The topic for today's webinar is uh, thin endometrium and management. So, I welcome all the participants. I request you to post your queries, if any, in the chat box so that we can have a short uh, QA session at the end of this presentation. And now it's time to introduce our invited speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Kavita Ma'am. Madam has done her MBBS, MS, DNB, and DGO. Madam is currently the senior consultant, uh, OG, fertility and laparoscopy at uh, Katanam Medical Center, Katanam, Kerala. And Madam is also the managing director of C and senior consultant gynecology and laparoscopy at Sri Krishna Hospital, Thirundapuram, Kerala, and uh, director of Sri Krishna Center of Fertility, Indivar Medico Private Limited, Thirundapuram, Kerala. So with this short introduction, I welcome you, ma'am. I'm handing the session to you for uh, further proceedings, ma'am. Welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, all. So uh, the topic of today is thin endometrium and the management of thin endometrium. So as we all know, endometrium is a complex organ. Uh, ma'am, ma'am, you have not shared your slide yet, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you can go for a slide share. Uh, slideshow mode, ma'am, and you can start your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So, good evening, all. Uh, our topic of today is thin endometrium and the management of thin endometrium. So, as we all know, endometrium is a complex organ under the constant influence of hormones. And embryo implantation is a very delicate process which involves the adherence of blastocysts to the endometrium. <clears throat> so synchronization between the endometrium, that is endometrial differentiation, and embryo development is required for a successful implantation. So coming to the anatomy of endometrium, endometrium can be divided morphologically into upper two-third, that is the functionalist layer, which comprises of stratum compactum and stratum spongiosum layer and the lower one third that is a vasalis layer. So the purpose of the functionalis layer is to prepare for the implantation. Therefore, it is the site of proliferation, secretion and degeneration. And the purpose of the vasalis layer is to provide the regenerative endometrium following menstruation. So how are we measuring the endometrium? So during a transvaginal ultrasound, the endometrium should be measured in the sagittal plane or the long axis and the measurement is of the thickest echogenic area from one stratum basalis endometrial interface across the endometrial canal to the other stratum basalis layer. The surrounding inner biometrial lucency is not included in this measurement. This measurement is usually taken within one centimeter of the fundal tip of the uterus. There can be inter-observer variability uh, around 1 millimeters with intra observer variability of approximately 0.6 to 0.7 millimeters. 0.7 millimeters. 
So in IV estimated cycles, the endometrial increases around 1.9 millimeters between days 7 and 9 of the stimulation treatment and 0.9 millimeters between days 9 and 11 and 0.6 millimeters between the latter and the day of HCG administration. So endometrial thickness is greatest in the andropositor dimension 7 millimeters or greater is associated with higher pregnancy rates. So coming to the endometrial pattern. Endometrial pattern is uh, the relative echogenicity of the endometrium and myometrium as seen on the longitudinal transvaginal scan. There are various scoring systems being used for grading the endometrium. Smith et al. classifies the endometrium into four types according to the echogenic texture pattern. So this is considered to be useful in deciding on the receptivity of the endometrium in IVF. So grade one, grade one is the hyper, hyper echoid. That is, it will be bright endometrium, which represents the post ovulatory or the luteal phase. And grade B endometrium is isoechoid. That is, the endometrial reflectivity will be similar to the myometrium. This characterizes the late follicular phase. And grade three, that is a triple line or a trilaminar appearance. Here, a solid area of reduced reflectivity appears on a darker area next to the light endometrium. This is the pattern that we will be mid follicular phase. This is, and next one is the grade B, that is echogenic black region surrounding the midline echo. So these echoes are absent in the endometrium, but a bright central echo is seen, which is, which is described as the triple layer. And uh, this usually further versions have been proposed subsequently, which includes a three grade system by Gond and Casper in 1990. These two grades are usually used, that is, uh, this grade 1, 2, 3, and type 1, 2, 3, or type ABC as described by Gond and Casper. So, type A is entirely homogeneous, that is, equivalent to type A of Smith um, grading system. It is entirely homogeneous, hyperechoic pattern without a central echogenic line. And type 2 is an intermediate isoechogenic pattern with the same reflectivity as the surrounding in the myometry and a non prominent or absent central echogenic line. And type 3, that is multi-layered triple line endometrium consisting of a prominent outer and central hyperechogenic line and inner hypoechogenic or a black region. So, coming to the Doppler grading, that is uterine blood flow by measuring the Doppler of the uterine arteries. A good blood supply towards the endometrium is usually considered to be an essential requirement for implantation. And therefore, assessment of endometrial blood flow in IVF treatment has important role in IVF cycle. So, changes in the endometrial vascularity appear present on the color Doppler examination, which may reflect the histological changes described by pathologists. So, perhaps the, uh, one we can uh, divide the endometrial and peri-endometrial areas into four zones. That is zone 1, 2, 3 and 4. Zone 1, as you can see, is the 1 to 2, two millimeter thick area that is surrounding the hyperechoic outer layer of the endometrium. And zone 2 is the hyperechoic endometrial edge that is the outer layer of the endometrium. And zone 3 is the hypoechoic inner layer of the endometrium that is the internal endometrial area which will be hypoechoic. And zone 4 is the endometrial cavity. So, it is possible to see variations in the depth of the vascular penetration before, during and after the mid-cycle. So, based upon these observations, most patients without diagnosed infertility, that is, they are presumed to be normal, usually demonstrate flow into the zone 3 by the mid-cycle. So, this is supposed to be ideal for fertility management. For IVF, we usually see whether the blood flow is up to zone 3 or more. That is supposed to be the best way to give the best out. So, there is another thing that we have to, we want to discuss is about the uterine biophysical profile. So, certain sonological qualities of the uterus are noted during the normal, um, during normal mid-cycle, which includes certain points like endometrial thickness in the greatest andropositor dimension of 7 millimeters or more. That is the full thickness measurement, a layered or a fine line appearance of the endometrium and blood flow within the zone 3 using the color Doppler technique, myometrial contractions causing a wave-like motion of the endometrium and uterine artery blood flow as measured by the pulsatility index less than 3 and a homogeneous myometrial echogenicity 
and myometrial blood flow seen on grayscale examination, that is internal to the heart gate muscles. The uterine scoring system for reproduction, in short form, that is termed as USSR, this comprises evaluation of the following parameters. So we can grade each parameter is scored as follows that is endometrial thickness if it is less than 7 millimeters it is graded as 0 and 7 to 9 millimeters as 2 10 to 14 millimeters as 3 and more than 14 millimeters as 1. endometrial layering if it shows no layer then it is 0 a hazy phylon appearance then it is graded as 1 a distinct phylar appearance is graded as 3 and myometrial contractions that is seen as wave-like endometrial motion high speed playback from the video tape so here it shows three contractions. If it shows three contractions in two minutes in real time, if it shows three contractions in two minutes, then it is graded as zero. And three contractions in more than three contractions in two minutes, it is graded as three. And coming to the myometrial echogenicity, if it is coarse or inhomogeneous echogenicity, it is graded as one. And relatively homogeneous echogenicity is graded as two. And uterinary Doppler flow. If the pulsatility index is 3, then it is graded as 0. If it is 2.99, it is 0. If it is less than 2.49, then it is 1. And if the index is less than 2, then it is graded as 2. Coming to the endometrial blood flow, within zone 3, if it is absent, it is 0. If it is present but it is sparse, then it is 2. And it is if it is present multifocally, that is it is present around the all around zone 3, then it is graded as 5. And grayscale myometrial blood flow internal to the arcuate muscles. It, if it is absent, it is zero, and if it is present, it is two. So these values assume a technically adequate ultrasound examination with no abnormalities of the uterine shape or development and no other gross uterine abnormalities. So a perfect score of 20 has been associated with 100% conception. Has been associated with 100% conception. So what that is the importance of uterine scoring system. So let us see when is the endometrium called thin. The, usually the cutoff for thin endometrium, we take it as less than 7 millimeters in the pre ovary phase. But successful pregnancies were documented with a minimum thickness of 4 millimeters. So this suggests that receptivity may not be entirely related to the thickness of the endometrium. There are so many other factors contributing to it. So coming to the oxygen tension. Here, uh, in preparation for implantation, you can see that the endometrium undergoes various transformations influenced by the ovarian hormones produced during the early secretory phase. So these modifications include, there will be an increase in the rate of blood flow, there will be increase in the number of cell proliferation of the stroma and, uh, and epithelium, there will be increase in the uterine oxygen consumption, and increase in the oxygen diffusion into the uterine movement, and there will be generalized edema. So usually we see a Increase high oxygen blood flow is seen in the basal layer. So what are the factors affecting the endometrial thickness? The three important factors that affect the growth of the endometrium are most important is the serum estradiol levels, then the blood flow to the uterus, and health of the endometrial tissue itself. So health of the endometrial tissue will be affected by previous injuries or infections to the endometrium and women's age. So, coming to the embryo maternal crosstalk. So, there are so many factors that influence the uh, embryo maternal crosstalk. That is, uh, leukemia inhibitor factors, interleukins, and colony stability factors. These are produced actively by the endometrial cells and these are shown to be important in the crosstalk between and endometrium and the embryo. Leukemia inhibitory factors likely to influence pre-implantation, implantation, embryo development and placentation. It has been screened in endometrial flushings and shown to, prove, uh, to be a screening marker for the endometrial receptivity. And uh, there are other factors like colony stimulating factor 1 which has been shown to be associated with recurrent uh, spontaneous abortions. If it is found to be low, then it has been found that uh, recurrent abortions have been documented. Increased production of CSF1 is expressed throughout pre-implantation, implantation, residual functions and placental growth. Interleukin-1 seems to be the first cytokine active in the endometrium embryo crosstalk, which then results in a second wave of cytokines. 
so this is uh, so this means that for implantation we need a good endometrium and a good embryo so what are the causes of thin endometrium coming to the iatrogenic causes the most important factor is recurrent dilatation and porosity of the endometrium and second one is myomectomy previous myomectomies where the cavity was open or an intracavitary myomectomy the certain section in which the uterine cavity has been curated to remove glass well bill endometrial polyps to have which had been removed and curated so it has been found that it is very difficult for the basal layer to grow if it is damaged during the course of the surgical treatment the tuberculosis is found to be a very important and common cause for thin and irreversibly damaged endometrium other factors are chronic bacterial infections sexually transmitted diseases it can lead to pelvic inflammatory diseases then low estrogen levels low estrogen levels uh, the endometrial layer will is found to be remaining thin like seen in pre pubertal girls or hypogonadotropic hypogonadism premature ovarian failure post menopause syndrome etc when we are using excessive lea uh, clomiphene citrate has been used for uh, recurrent cycles it has been found that it is lead to estrogen receptor down regulation in the endometrium and persistently thin endometrium for a longer duration even after stopping the medications and and it has been found that prolonged use of progesterone and combined oral contraceptive pills has also led to thin endometrium for a for few cycles or even after stopping the combined oral contraceptive pills and the other causes uh, radiation to the uterus causes of inadequate blood flow so high blood flow impedance of radial arteries which could be a trigger this bias the growth of the glandular endometrium so this will lead to a decrease in the vascular epithelial growth factor levels in the endometrium so low vagf leads to poor vascular development which leads to further reduced blood flow into the endometrium this vicious cycle leads to a thin endometrium which in turn is related to impaired endometrial receptivity it has been suggested that high blood flow impedance in the radial arteries during the starting of the menstrual menstruation this can be a useful predictor of a thin endometrium that is if there is a high blood flow impedance of the radial arteries that is seen immediately after periods so although this high blood flow impedance of radial arteries why this is happening is the cause is unclear certain systemic causes has also been found uh, leading to thin endometrium like hypertension diabetic asthma depression epilepsy substance abuse like smoking and there are so many other idiopathic factors also so coming to a summary the causes of thin endometrium are low estrogen levels poor endometrial blood blood supply high androgen levels and in the damage to the endometrium by different causes so endometrial damage usually because of inflammation radiation or aggressive porotage low estradiol because of uh, prolonged use of clomiphene or poor ovarian cancer hypogonadotropic hypogonadism poor endometrial blood supply because of myomectomy or intrauterine narrations and decreased vagf of expression so how do we assess the endometrium so there are uh, various um, methods to assess the endometrium as we have discussed most important is by the transvaginal ultrasound endometrial histology dating can also be done which was done previously but it is invasive next one is hysteroscopy during hysteroscopy we can see whether the cavity is vascular or if it is um bald looking and the next uh, set that is next uh, test that we can do is the endometrial receptivity assay so just a few words about endometrial receptivity assay endometrial receptivity uh, assay is or uh, endometrial ER test so this is uh, usually done where there is recurrent ivf failure recurrent implantation failure so this is a customized microarray for genes involved in the endometrial receptivity and it is predictive for endometrial dating so this determines whether the sample that is collected is in the window of implantation and whether the endometrium is receptive so how this is done is that compares the genetic profile of the endometrium with that of lh that is luteinizing hormone plus 7 in a natural cycle or if you are adding progesterone the date of the stone starting plus 5 days in a chart so the result from the test will determine if a woman is receptive or not on the day and in the kind of cycle when the biopsy was performed so if it is if she is receptive it means that her window of implantation 
falls on the day of the cycle during which the biopsy was performed. And therefore, we can transfer the blastocyst and this could implant on the day during the same kind of cycle that we are using the same type of medicine and we are starting progesterone and doing the transfer on the date of biopsy, on the similar date of biopsy. If we get a non-receptive result, so this could imply that a displaced window of implantation is there. So therefore, a second biopsy would be needed to validate this displacement. For that, a specific day for a second biopsy will be suggested according to the first result is obtained. This will allow the implantation in a subsequent cycle with a personalized embryo transfer. So this has shown to be highly sensitive and specific for detecting gene expression profiles associated with receptivity. So these are the patterns that we usually see. So type A, uh, the hypoechoic type trilaminar and uh, the isoechoic pattern. So coming to the blood flow, the initial one subendometrial, outer hypoechoic, middle line and the fourth type that is type 4 according to the Applebaum criteria it is up to the cavity. So, receptive in index less than 0.9 and uh, pulsatility index less than 3 has shown to have success in IVF outcomes. So, how can we improve endometrial, endometrial thickness? Actually, there are no clear-cut consensus or criteria for the management of thin endometrial. So many uh, medications we use like oral medications, injectables and intrauterine injections and some have been found to be effective um, in our experience. Oral medications that we use are uh, estradiol, vitamin E, tamoxifen, sildenafil, and aspirin. Injectables that we use are injections like HCG or GNR antagonist, platelet-rich plasma, stem cell therapy, and granulocyte colon stimulating factor. So estradiol, uh, valerate, well, this is this we can take either uh, orally or we can use as patches of estradiol hemihydrate or injectables or a vaginal estradiol valerate is also available. So oral uh, dose, uh, we can, there are two types. That is, one is uh, we start with a step up protocol. That is, we start with two milligram starting from day three to day five and we increase the dose to four milligram per day from day 6 to day 9 and then we increase up to 6 milligram from day 10 onwards still we get a satisfactory endometrial thickness or we can start initially from a high dose like 6 to 8 milligram per day that is 2 but 2 milligram is a single tablet so we can start with 2 2 2 or uh, 3 3 3 per day up to 16 milligrams can be given so the advantage of uh, estradiol patches is that no first pass metabolism is there but several patches may be required for to reach a steady state serum concentration. If the patient is not tolerating orally, oral estradiol is a oral tablets the patient can't tolerate. There are other options like vaginal, uh, vaginal estradiol, but it's highly uh, uh, risky in some elderly individuals because of risk of thrombosis. So if, when we find a thin endometrium in a fresh cycle, so what are, what are the uh, actions that we can take? One is we can change the stimulation protocol. This might help in increasing the endometrial thickness. We can add astradiol to the fresh cycle. Adjoints can be added. Or the last best, but the best option is to freeze all the embryos and to transfer at a later time. So in fresh cycle, uh, adding a estradiol, that is adding luteal estradiol supplementation in stimulated cycles. It has been found to improve the pregnancy rates and hence improve IVF, I embryo transfer rates and pregnancy rates also. That is, we are adding estradiol after pickup and uh, towards the luteal cycle. In an agonist cycle, what we can do is that we can add, it has been found that um, significantly higher implantation rates and pregnancy rates were found in patients who received low dose estradiol, that is 2 milligram, compared with no estradiol. But the best outcomes were found significantly in the groups with high dose estradiol, that is 6 milligram supplementation. It has been found around 51.3% with high dose. Low dose, the percentage was pregnancy rates were 32.8 and with no estradiol, it was only 23.1. So in patients with thin endometrium undergoing fresh cycle, we suggest against the use of uh, your luteal estradiol to improve, we suggest the use of estradiol to improve pregnancy rates. 
In fresh IVF embryo transfer cycles, patients with thin endometrium can be offered elective cryopreservation, that is freeze all of embryos and transfer in a subsequent cycle. So fresh, um, what do we suggest for a frozen embryo transfer? So in frozen embryo transfer, which is the best? So either it can be a natural cycle or a HRT cycle or a stimulated cycle. So in natural cycle, it may be either a pure natural cycle or a modified natural cycle. And HRT cycle, it can be either without down regulation or with down regulation. So several um, high quality randomized controlled trials have not been done, so it is very scarce. So the best protocol is for evidence is poor, but we have found that uh, to start progesterone intake on the theoretical day of OSA retrieval in HRT and to perform blastocyst transfer at HCG plus 7 in a natural cycle or in a modified cycle LH plus 6th day respectively. It has been found to increase the uh, pregnancy rates. For so patients with a thin endometrium in ART treatment undergoing endometrial preparation for embryo transfer, there is insufficient evidence according to Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society there is insufficient evidence that any specific protocol, either in the natural cycle or a hormone replacement cycle, for endometrial preparation provides better pregnancy outcomes. So there have been no significant evidence that any specific protocol is found to increase the endometrial thickness. So how for how long we can supplement the estrogen? Endometrial receptivity is found to be very tolerant to a wide duration of treatment. That is, uterine prescription and preparation consisting of 6 mg estradiol valerate can be extended to as long as 5 weeks with no significant decrease in the endometrial receptivity. No, uh, it has been found that long duration of estradiol therapy is not deleterious. The general microplace estradiol achieves a higher endometrial concentration, but decreasing the length of estradiol therapy is found to be beneficial in terms of cost and also the time to pregnancy. Coming to the next oral medication that uh, it has been found is aspirin. So the mechanism of action of aspirin is it reduces the subendometrial contractility, it inhibits cyclooxidase enzymes, increases the prostaglandin, uterine, increases the uterine blood flow, and reduces the receptivity. Low dose aspirin is used, that is 81 milligram or 100 milligrams of aspirin is used. Assistance index, sorry. So the mechanism of action of aspirin is it reduces the subendometrial contractility, it inhibits cyclooxygenase enzyme, and thus it reduces the progesterone uh, prostaglandins and it reduces the uterine blood flow resistance index. But it, didn't, it is not found to improve the endometrial thickness, but it has been found to increase the pregnancy rates. So Cochrane studies uh, has not found any significant substantially positive effect on pregnancy and endometrial thickness. The other oral medication that we can use is vitamin E and pentoxifilin. So pentoxifilin is a derivative of methyl sandine. This induces vasodilatation. It is antifibrotic. So this is found to be effective in radiation-induced fibrosis. The role of vitamin E. Vitamin E is an antioxidant and a vasodilator. And this improves the glandular epithelium and VEGF expression. The dosage of pentoxifilin is 800 mg plus 1000 international units of vitamin E. This can be given for at least 6 to 8 months. So vitamin E administration uh, could not, it is not found to improve the endometrial thickness. It could improve, sorry, it could improve the endometrial thickness, but implantation rates were not found in women with, uh, improved implantation rates were not found in women with unexplained infertility. 600 international units of vitamin E daily significantly increase the endometrial thickness in 52% of patients with an endometrial thickness of less than 8 millimeters. So the vitamin E, vitamin e also found to improve the uterine radial artery resistance index. Coming to the next oral medication that we can use is L-arginine. So L-arginine is a uh, precursor to nitric oxide. How it is mechanism of action, it increases the nitric oxide release and thus it increases the vascular flow. The dosage is 6 milligrams per day. Can it be used routinely? Uh, it has been found that increased vascular flow of the radial uterine arteries in 89% of patients and endometrial growth more than 8 millimeters were documented in 67% of patients. But there is lack of uh, randomized controlled trials for its routine use. Coming to the role of sildenafil. 
So sildenafilin um, citrate, it has been uh, the mechanism of action is that it reduces the NK activity. That is the nuclear killer cell activity. The dosage is 25 milligram per every six hours, but it has to be stopped after pregnancy has been confirmed. Uh, improved endometrial thickness was found with sildenafil, but not effective in cases of any previous endometrial activity. That is, if there is any previous endometrial curettage or any endometrial destruction. A randomized controlled trial in 2013 had showed that improved endometrial thickness when compared to estrogen. So, Cochrane 2014 concluded that there is insufficient evidence that vasodilators improve pregnancy rates. Coming to the role of tamoxifen. So, tamoxifen, as you know, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Patients with PCOS have been found to be benefiting best from tamoxifen and they have achieved better pregnancy outcomes with, along with tamoxifen. So, this is a promising alternative for patients with thin endometrium. The dosage is 20 mg of tamoxifen daily in, from the starting of day 1 to day 5. So, what is the role of HCG? The HCG, as you know, is produced by the endometrium, uh, for, by the embryo, it stimulates the progesterone production. So, how it uh, helps is that it helps the embryo invasion into the endometrium and immune tolerance. So, it has got a local paracrine action to the LH receptor. It reduces the IgFP1, it increases the leukemia uh, inhibiting factor and VEGF. The dosage is 150 international units. That is, small dose of HCG is given daily for seven days, starting from the eighth day of starting estrogen. It has been concluded that HCG priming of endometrium leads to significant improvement of the endometrial thickness. So, coming to the role of uh, GCSF. So, GCSF is a glycoprotein with both growth factor and cytokine activities. It stimulates the mesenchymal stem cells stem cells and helps in the endometrial skin cyclical growth and reconstruction. Uh, the dosage is 300 micrograms that is given. It is found in 1 ml of filigrastu that is in um, recombinant human granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Approximately this is given approximately 6 to 12 hours before HCG administration in a natural cycle. In the it is in a fresh cycle. Repeated GCS of infusion can be given if endometrial is less than 7 millimeters on the inside retrieval day. If you are planning for a fresh, fresh transfer. How the procedure is done? If it is found the endometrial thickness is less than 7 millimeters with the estrogen therapy, we can give 300 micrograms. This is instilled into the uterine cavity by using an intrauterine insemination catheter. If the endometrial thickness does not improve, we can repeat the installation also 12 hours after 12 hours. If it is being used intravenously, it has to be diluted in 5% dextrose and never in saline. Intrauterine insemination it is given with a 1 ml insulin syringe 6 to 12 hours before HCG administration. So, several studies have been done showing increase in thickness of the endometrium using GCSF. Uh, some certain dramatic improvements have been found. Usually up to 7 millimeters is enough because it increases the vascularity also. So, in 12th to 13th day of the cycle, usually we can repeat if the endometrial thickness is below 7 millimeters within 40 to 72 hours. So, this is the study that shows the increase in endometrial thickness using GCSF. Several randomized controlled clinical trials have also been done with endometrial perfusion using GCSF in IVF cycles. But RCTs, more RCTs are required to reach the conclusion regarding the usefulness of GCSF in treating patients with unresponsive endometrium. So, what is the role of platelet-rich plasma or PRP? So, PRP is autologous red plasma so that is enriched with platelets around 4 to 5 times. So, what is the uh, content that gives the advantage of PRP? So, it contains VGS, VGF, PDGF, endometrial growth factor, TGF that are released when the platelets are activated in the plasma. So, this stimulates the proliferation and regeneration of the endometrium and the release of cytokines. So, actually preparation of platelet-rich plasma is not very complicating. It is, uh, how this is done is that we collect the blood, around 30 to 60 ml of blood is drawn from the patient's arm and we separate the platelets using a centrifuge. 
this blood is in, uh, placed in the centrifuge and the centrifuge separates the platelets from the rest of the blood components. We extract the PRP, around 3 to 6 ml of PRP is needed. So 0.5 to 1 ml of intrauterine installation is done on day 10. The second infusion can be done around 48 to 72 hours later if the endometrial thickness is less than 7 millimeters. CRP infusion is, uh, can be done one to two times in each cycle. So PRP is, uh, it is found to be more accessible and affordable with minimal risk of transmission of infectious diseases and immunological reactions when compared to GCSF. But we have limited evidence regarding this approach. So further large, larger, well-designed clinical trials are needed for recommending generalized use of PRP for thin endometry. So coming to the role of stem cells, actually theoretically embryonic stem cells uh, are recovered from the excess of IVF embryos. This can induce production of uterine uh, in the uh, thickness of the uterine endometrium. Adult bone marrow has been a source of stem cells also, but this is in the trial phase only. Hematopoietic and non-hematopoietic bone marrow derived stem cells, that is BM, DS, CS, that is hematopoietic and non-hematopoietic poietic bone marrow derived stem cells. These are recruited to the endometrium in response to a small injury. So this has been found to play a role in regeneration of the endometrial stroma. So we can see the procedure how it is done. The bone marrow aspiration is done from the iliac crust. Around 45 ml of bone marrow was aspirated and this bone marrow was centrifuged and one or two million of uh, mononuclear cells were separated. 39 million marker positive endometrial angiogenic cells, 2% autologous, that is patient's own heat inactivated serum and CD133 plus is isolated. On the second day of menstrual cycle, a curettage was done under anesthesia with an ET cannula, that is endometrial, um, with an embryo transfer catheter, a 0.7 ml of stem cell suspension was injected in dry uterine under ultrasound guidance. Two to three cycles of cyclical estrogen and progesterone therapy were continued, and we have it was found that the endometrial thickness was 6.9 millimeters, with vascularity reaching up to the intra endometrial region, which led to successful pregnancy with donor embryo transfer. So this was the study that was conducted. This was also found to be uh, effective in Asherman's refractory Asherman's syndrome. Reflected by restoration of the menstruation, five out of six cases. So coming to the role of endometrial scratching. So this, uh, how this helps in thickening of the endometrium is that it induces desterilization of the endometrium. So uh, uh, when a small injury is given to the endometrium deliberately, it releases cytokines, growth factors, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And this endometrial injury is found to improve blood flow. So a recruitment of stem cells are found to be in the endometrium, thus creating a partially new endometrium, free of epigenetic factors. So scratching, does, uh, studies have found that scratching enhances the receptivity of the endometrium, but a number of other pathologies may be responsible for implantation failure. It was not found to be associated with higher live birth rates. It was found to be associated with increase in thickness of the endometrium, but not associated with higher live birth rates. So coming to the take home points that we have discussed, a number of treatments have been tried for thin refractory endometrium, but more validated studies are needed. Thilidinafil, vitamin E, aspirin, l etc. have been used to improve the endometrial vascularity. In drive insertion of granulocyte colony stimulating factor and PRP is currently the most popular treatment, but still larger trials are needed. Stem cell therapies is in the state of research. And uh, endometrial receptivity assay, stem cells, and PRP is the future of thickening of endometrial receptivity, improving the endometrial receptivity. So, to, to conclude, we can see that it is not only really the best seed that is needed, but preparing a healthy soil is a must. It is the endometrial pattern rather than the absolute thickness so that results in the uh, in a positive result. But even after all these uh, things that we have discussed thin endometrium might still be a remain refractory and in this case surrogacy may be an option that is needed after recurrent implantation failure. Thank you all for your patient hearing.
thank you ma'am thank you very much for that uh, another wonderful presentation ma'am almost uh, you uh, simplified the uh, topic ma'am hope uh, audience must have understood well ma'am ma'am let me wait for one or two minutes for the participants to post their queries ma'am if any if there is any queries in related to you ma'am uh, ma'am i have a question like is there any maximum size for endometrium uh, lining ma'am so when you, when you are going for any embryo transfer if the Uh, endometrium is too thick then is there will be any problem for this embryo transfer ma'am actually uh, in my personal experience uh, i have transferred up to uh, 1.2 cm uh, but i have seen that as the thickness improves the vascularity uh, of the endometrium uh, will be coming down into the zone 4 so more of more than 1.2 i have not transferred and the vascularity uh, in my personal experience it has found to be reducing as the thickness Uh, is increasing. So up okay, to 1.2 is fine, I think. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, we have one question from the participants. Ma'am, what is the? Uh, is there any adverse effects for this PRP treatment in embryo transfer? Ma'am, sorry, in endometrial uh, problem. Ma'am, PRP actually it is the patient's own. It is an autologous blood transfusion, so I don't think there is any disadvantage. We have to uh, see it in the research level only. Okay, ma'am. PRP is actually it is the upcoming uh, treatment for so many things like um, hair loss, acne. Uh, okay. So many in dermatology yes. and all it's where it's in the upcoming uh, treatment. So we have not uh, discussed regarding it's the patient's own blood that is transferred. Okay, ma'am. Now, ma, when is a radical surgery uh, radical surgery indicated for endometriosis, ma'am? Radical surgery. when it is indicated exactly indicated ma'am in infertility or otherwise in infertility ma'am infertility if you are trying yes. infertility actually this uh, endometriosis means um, the quality of the embryo of the egg that we tr- we collect will be poor so if you are planning for if it is stage 4 this end of endometriosis is stage 1 to stage 4 and um, in ivf or normally what are you i, I didn't get your question Yeah, ma'am. I too didn't get the question, ma'am. I think it should be in IVF only, ma'am. IVF. So if it is here, if the um, endometriosis are hindering your uh, egg uh, retrieval, then it is okay. Not. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, this uh, removal of fibroids also is another one uh, important factor when it comes to this uh, uh, infertility treatment, ma'am. So just to remove fibroids on the lining, ma'am. So, how much fibroids can be removed, ma'am? Has to be removed, ma'am. Actually, fibroids and um, infertility. In, usually, we have seen uh, patients coming with uh, pregnancy with large fibroids, and sometimes we um, we ask the patients to get the fibroids removed if there is any IVF failure. That the indication is for is that the small fibroids can become a focus of contraction, and can lead to ex- expulsion of the embryo that is in, that is uh, transferred. so even if it is the embryo if the fibroid is not into the cavity also sometimes in case of recurrent failures we advise to uh, get the fibroids removed and in all cases if the endometrium if we are doing a hysteroscopy and the fibroids are found to hinder uh, found to be protruding into the cavity this has to be removed and uh, we have removed so many the number of fibroids that is removed is unlimited we can remove any if uh, we are planning a pregnancy and uh, If you are doing a surgery, or what all fibroids we see, we remove. We have to undergo get them removed by myomectomy. So the number is not the issue. Where the fibroid is situated, that is the uh, yes, most important thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I don't find any other questions in the chat box, ma'am. Only these two questions are there. So, ma'am, uh, if you allow us, then we can end the webinar for today, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much, yeah, ma'am. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, being with us today, ma'am. That was uh, once again a wonderful session, ma'am. Ma'am, and we are looking for uh, many more webinars with you, ma'am. And uh, we need your support in all our uh, uh, connect activities, yes, also, ma'am. There's been so, thank you, ma'am. Experience uh, uh, with you, Shri Healthcare. No, ma'am. I look forward for more association with you. Yes, ma'am. Welcome, ma'am. And we are happy to uh, guide you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So I would also like to thank the participants for their active participation, ma'am, and I also like to thank my uh, team for making arranging this webinar from Kerala. Ma'am. Thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. Okay.
Yes, ma'am. We can end the webinar.